So for CCNT in chapter number one, we are going to explore the network, all right? That means a basic introduction to networking fundamentals. We'll talk about different concepts of networking. We'll talk about different aspects of networking. And we're going to kind of work our way through something called the OSI model. You guys ever heard of that? The Open System Interconnect model. And we're going to talk about the various aspects of communication. But we're going to do it from an engineering perspective. So I'm going to be using various tools. I'm going to be using various methods to show you guys or demonstrate a lot of these concepts that we're going to learn about. Okay? So uh, when it comes to networking, uh, there are essentially many, many different components. Uh, uh, Atula, we will definitely talk about what OSI stands for. Uh, it, technically, it stands for Open Systems Interconnect, but uh, and it was developed by an organization. But we'll see that a little bit later on and I'll explain what that means because it's more important to understand what it means than the acronym, right? But when it comes to networking technology, uh, the components of a network often change depending on the perspective of the administrator, right? For example, server and desktop and application administrators, database administrators, tend to look at the network from the perspective of the top layer down, right? The application layer, the session layer, the presentation layer, and so on. Whereas network engineers and network uh, technicians tend to look at the network from the bottom up, right? The physical layer, the data link layer, which is where switching occurs, and the network layer, which is where routing occurs. In this class, our focus is on those bottom layers. We're going to talk about routing. We're going to talk about switching. We're going to talk about cabling. We're going to talk about different aspects of cabling in the class as well. Um, so we have devices. We have, uh, uh, you know, uh, different types of devices that exist in the network. There is a term that we see a lot today called IoT, right? You guys heard of that? The Internet of Things. What does that mean today? What is it supposed to represent, the Internet of Things? Everything is connected to the network, right? Um, it is uh, it's pretty amazing, actually, that uh, where we come from and where we are today. I mean, everything is connected to the network. Your TV, your vacuum cleaner, your refrigerator, your door locks, your, uh, I mean, uh, if I think about just the things in my house, even my light bulbs are connected to the network, right? And I can control the colors and I can control the, the, uh, the, the, the brightness, and just by talking to my Alexa and say, hey, Alexa, make all the lights purple, and all my lights in my house turn purple, right? Uh, it's pretty amazing, right? But it changes, and, and from a business perspective, it's the same thing, right? Uh, everything in the business is, protect, uh, is connected as well. So it changes how we look at the network infrastructure. It changes how we look at the network from a security standpoint, from a, from a usability standpoint, from an availability standpoint, and so on. Now, of course, in this class, we're not going to talk about all the different aspects of, of components that we see. We're going to talk about routing and switching. So when it comes to devices, our focus is going to be on layer two and layer three, which is our routing and our switching. Uh, not switching first, layer two, routing at layer three. Uh, the devices that essentially allow us to get the data from one point of the network to the other point of the network. Uh, infrastructure, right? Now, I imagine that because you guys wear many hats, you guys are probably system administrators as well, right? So you have to handle things like uh, servers and desktops and so on. We'll talk a little bit about that technology as we go through this class, but our primary focus is going to be on routing and switching, okay? We'll also talk about the media. How do we interconnect our devices? This area is shifting a lot. In fact, uh, there's a couple of uh, videos on our YouTube channel about uh, how wireless is changing everything today. Wireless always used to kind of be a, uh, a, a, an auxiliary component to a network. It just gave you a little bit of mobility. It allowed you to connect in, in various uh, locations. But the reality is wireless is gradually starting to replace your wired infrastructure. 
because we're now seeing wireless access points with 802.11 AC um, wave two, and we have wave one, and now we have wave two. We're starting to see gigabit speed and gigabit throughput. Uh, with multiple input, multiple output technology, we're starting to see full duplex operations and so on. Uh, but the media includes many things. It includes boosted pair Ethernet, it includes fiber optics, it includes uh, wireless and so on. Uh, we actually have a whole chapter dedicated to the media discussion. And then the services that are running on the network, right? Now, when you guys think of services as a system administrator, you think of services like what? Like, uh, you know, DNS, DHCP, FTP, database applications, Citrix applications, whatever. Uh, but when it comes to the network, when we talk about the switching aspect and we talk about the routing aspect, services are things like spanning tree, the VLAN trunking protocol, um, uh, EIGRP or OSPF, protocols that we use to make sure that the network is intelligent and the network can make the appropriate decisions on how to transfer data from one point of the network to the other. Right? Certainly there are application layer services that hosts need to communicate, but there are also infrastructure services that the infrastructure needs to be able to communicate. And we're gonna spend a lot of time talking about that, okay? So from a media perspective, very simple, we have twisted pair ethernet. Uh, we had some other things like 10 base five and 10 base two. Uh, we'll talk a little bit about that stuff later on when we get to the physical layer. Um, we have fiber optic communications. Uh, and various options within fiber optic, and we have wireless communication. There's actually enough to talk about in the wireless space that there's a whole separate certification on wireless, CCNA wireless and CCMB wireless. Uh, we don't talk a lot about wireless in this class, um, but uh, we will kind of uh, take a look at a little bit of wireless as we move through the, through the class. So the goal of any network is to ensure that we have connectivity, right? Make sure that we have the appropriate connectivity. Uh, and in order to be able to accomplish this in our infrastructure, in order to be able to accomplish this, in order to accomplish this connectivity, we have to have devices that are interconnected. So obviously in most cases, you guys are gonna be dealing with a local area network. That is the network that, is, uh, that allows connectivity between your devices within your enterprise, right? Whether it's across multiple buildings, multiple, multiple uh, outbuildings for like a school or, or different campus locations, if it's a couple of different hotel properties, whatever it might be, you have that local area network, right? Now, what kind of services are we running in this local area network? This is a pretty typical building design model that Cisco promotes. Uh, and we will see how this applies throughout the rest of the week uh, where they have something called a three-layer hierarchical model, okay? This is a three-layer model. You've got the core of your network and the core is responsible for getting data from point A to point B. And uh, its goal is to do that as quickly as possible uh, without any delay. So in the core, we have routing essentially, all right? We route everything at the core. Uh, we don't run any policies at the core. We're not applying security at the core. We're not applying any kind of QoS policies or any kind of security policies. It's purely IP routing. The distribution layer is the layer that we typically design into our LAN that has all the intelligence built into it. Uh, things like policy-based routing, things like VLAN, inter-VLAN routing, uh, QoS policies for quality of service to ensure delivery of datagrams, uh, and so on. Access control and security. Uh, everything happens at the distribution layer. These are the brains, this is the brains of your, your network, essentially, right? Um, now, oftentimes, companies will collapse these two components together. They don't have the budget or the dollars or the or the, uh, the, the need to have separate cores and separate distribution layers. So we'll have something called a collapsed core, all right? Okay, uh, and then we have our access layer. The access layer is where we have our, our layer two devices, typically our switches, 
And of course, that's where our clients are connected. So at the access layer, we might extend our VLANs down to this access layer. We might extend some sort of uh, port-based security like 802.1x or, or uh, uh, switch port port security to these components um, and so on. So this is where we're gonna connect our phones, our PCs, our printers, anything that's going to be connecting to the network today. There used to be a rule in network design, particularly in land design, that was called the 80-20 rule. All right? And if you ever studied uh, CCMA back in the day, uh, in the, the, the late 90s and the early 2000s, you would always read about this 80-20 rule. And the 80-20 rule basically said this. 80% of the traffic stays in the land. 20% of the traffic leaves the land and gets routed to other locations using a wide area network or some other uh, type of uh, a network. This has changed though, right? We're no longer doing 80-20, we're doing 20-80, right? And what's changed in networking today that, that drives us to this kind of 20-80 rule? 20% of the traffic stays within the land 80% of the traffic leaves the network. What do you guys think it is? Yeah. Cloud computing, right? Cloud-based computing, uh, infrastructure as a service, software as a service. Uh, I mean, there's a whole bunch of uh, different as a service services that are available. But cloud computing, uh, advanced data center design, remote data centers, and so on, have driven this uh, most of the traffic out of the land and most of the traffic gets routed today as opposed to switched, all right? Um, now, we won't talk about data centers necessarily in this class, but we do talk about that shift and, and how that shift has changed uh, uh, how we look at networks today and how we design networks today, right? One of the key uh, changes that's occurred is in the wide area network space, right? In wide area networks, where traditionally we had very limited types of connectivity, limited types of communication. We could do maybe some frame relay. We might be able to do some, some slow speed point-to-point uh, -point serial links using HDL or PPP. But for the most part, we didn't have a lot of options. Now we have things like DPLS and DPWS, which are uh, uh, layer two um, MPLS solutions. We've got layer three MPLS VPNs. Uh, we've got IWAN technology that's available now, which is really just kind of a, a combination of a whole bunch of different technologies. We've got DM VPN. Uh, uh, we've got uh, Get VPN. There are uh, a whole bunch of technologies that we can use to interconnect our locations. Right? Uh, this technology really gives us the ability to expand our reachability. Right? Now, that being said, what are some of the most common aspects of a wide area network? Number one, they're not owned by you as an organization, they're owned by a third party, a telephony service provider, or a telecommunication service provider, excuse me. We used to call them ISPs, right? Internet service providers. But they're much more than that now. They provide telecommunications. Um, so you might see AT&T or, or uh, uh, Verizon or Sprint or L3. These guys are providers that allow us to interconnect our location. And then we overlay our communication on top of their infrastructure. Right? So let's say, for example, I want to connect LA to New York. Right? Well, I have a cloud, and that cloud is the TSP, and then I can choose a method of transporting my data. The cloud can be layer two. Oftentimes, it's layer two, so it looks like a switch, but sometimes it can be layer three, where the service provider actually participates in your routing and so on. MPLS VPN is very much like that. And MPLS, we, and we'll talk about that a little bit later, all right, we'll talk about that a little bit later. The sound is not uh, working very well. Not back on, so you should be able to hear better now. Uh, we'll talk about that aspect a little bit later. We'll talk about MPLS and so on. Does that sound better, guys? Sorry, I took off my speakerphone and then I 
had to turn back on after. Okay? Using my cell phone, so I apologize. Okay? Uh, we'll actually talk about MPLS. Uh, we talk about MPLS in a very basic uh, concept, but uh, we will talk about some MPLS technology a little bit later on. Traditionally, the WAN itself has consisted of layer two protocols, right? These are some of those traditional, uh, we haven't talked about the OSI model yet. We'll talk about that a little bit later, but these are some of those traditional WAN technologies. Frame relay, X.25, HDLC, uh, PPP, and so on. If we have time, the, the end of the class, we, we talk about these, these technologies. Hopefully we'll have time to get through that. Sometimes we do, sometimes we don't, okay? So anyway, that is, uh, uh, that is the WAN, all right? And, and what does the WAN allow us to do? It allows us to connect geographically dispersed locations. What is another characteristic of a WAN that's different from a LAN? How about speed and bandwidth, right? The WAN is usually a much slower type of connection where you might be operating at maybe one megabit per second or maybe 10 megabits per second. Very, very rarely are you going to see, you know, this ability to support the LAN uh, at high speeds like we would see inside of the LAN. I mean, the LAN, we're dealing with speeds like, uh, uh, you know, of, of 10 gigs and, and 100 gigs now um, with this new technology. All right? Okay. An interesting aspect of this communication process is how we interconnect the globe, right? Uh, most people don't think about this. They think from the perspective of wireless or satellite communication and so on. But there's actually a, uh, a whole underground, literally underwater, I guess, of uh, these different connections called submarine cables that allow us to interconnect all of our locations throughout the world, right? These are fiber optic bundles that connect different continents to each other. And if I want to go from one continent to another, I run over these, uh, these fiber optic communications. There's a website, I just pulled it up, submarinecablemap.com, and you can actually, it's an interactive website, and you can actually kind of look at where you are in the globe and how you're connected and so on. And all of these different colored lines here are literally fiber optic bundles that have been rolled off the back of a ship. They're very rarely buried. They're usually just, uh, we might do a little trench or we might just allow them to float down to the bottom of the ocean floor. But uh, these are actually literally cables that connect our world. Um, so for example, if I wanted to go up to this continent here or this, these chain of islands, this is the cable that would be used literally to communicate to that, uh, that chain of islands, right? Uh, it was installed in January of 2004. It's 2,700 kilometers, um, and it uh, connects to uh, uh, these two different locations in Norway. So uh, uh, whatever, however you say that. Okay, so, so. All right, but um, that's how the globe is interconnected. Uh, through these submarine cables. Uh, you can see, obviously, we, we have quite a few different types of connections that go from, from the United States to Asia and then from the United States over to, uh, to Europe and whatnot. Um, and uh, it's very interesting because I can do a trace route, for example, and I'm going to demonstrate this in a minute, but I can do a trace route to uh, uh, a different location, and I can almost predict what type of cable that traffic is going over just based on the landing points that I'm hitting as I'm, as I'm moving through the network, all right? Inside the continent, right, inside most countries, we have infrastructure as well. We're very fortunate in the United States because we have lots and lots of competing Internet service providers that are trying to get our business, right? In fact, a lot of them are Tier 1 providers. Uh, tier 1 providers make up the Internet. There's about 13, 14, 15 or something like that. I can't, don't quote me on that number, but uh, if you go out to Google and you search on Tier 1 Internet providers, uh, they are uh, the ones that make up the Internet. They're the ones that have all the big routers. Uh, this is one of those routers. You can actually tell that to that router. 
uh, login. It's a Juniper router, and you can see the Internet backbone. You can see all the routes. There's millions and millions of routes on the Internet. Um, what's interesting is about how traffic moves across the continent. That happens to be L3. So L3 is our Tier 1 service provider. L3 is a uh, um, fiber optic network across the United States. Um, I don't know if you guys have ever noticed, but the next time you go out and you look at those high-tension power lines, you know, the ones, the big towers, and they have lots and lots of power cables going across them, you'll notice that most of those lines have ceramic uh, insulators connecting the lines to the tower, except for the one on the top. The one on the top is fiber optic cable, right? And uh, because power lines actually provide, uh, you know, major connectivity to a lot of different <laughs> cities and a lot of different locations. So we will often see how um, the backbones, these backbones are built on those power, those, those towers, right? So it's very, very interesting. Um, but what's the most interesting thing? Uh, and this is uh, something that I think uh, um, really demonstrates this, uh, this functionality, is I can come to, um, I can come into my little, uh, command prompt here, and I can do a trace route. We'll talk about this a little bit later on, to um, uh, cisco.pw, okay? And basically what it's, is it's kind of give me an idea of what path I'm taking to get to that destination. Uh, sometimes it works, sometimes it doesn't work, it depends. We'll talk more about this tool a little bit later on, but the point that I want to make here as this runs, is that my computer here is generating these datagrams. And by the way, it applies to this WebEx as well. We've got hundreds of people joined on the WebEx from all over the world, and they happen to be seeing my slides and listening to my, to my voice. Um, and I'm delivering this information across the globe in milliseconds. It's amazing, right? That I can generate little ones and zeros from my laptop and have them go all over the, the country and then eventually across some sort of, uh, of, of uh, you know, submarine cable and reach their destination. Of course, I didn't pick a very good one because Cisco redirected me to a local uh, route because I'm in the United States. But in any event, we're talking about delivery in, you know, 100 milliseconds, 200, 500 milliseconds, and my data is going over a cable that's 10,000 kilometers long you know, or 18,000 kilometers long under ground or under the uh, ocean. It's pretty amazing when you think about it, okay? So uh, even though it's kind of really not necessary to know for the test, it's interesting to look at, you know, this, this infrastructure and see how everything is connected. You're starting to see a lot of companies now, um, like Google and uh, um and uh, who else? Uh, Google and um, can't think of it now. I know Verizon has done a few. They're running their own cables now because they want dedicated bandwidth to serve their top, their clients. Uh, it's not cheap, obviously. You can imagine it's you know hundreds of millions of dollars to put one of these cables in. All right, um, and maybe even more. I don't know. Maybe miss. I don't know. All right. No. I mean, well, I mean, I'm sure that, uh, you know, you have to plan the route appropriately and they have to be installed and they have to meet certain regulations. But uh, usually it's a third-party company and then they lease bandwidth to providers. Or a lot of times multiple providers will share the burden of the cost, right? So if you go to one of these cables, let me uh, pull up the uh, map here. You go to any one of these cables, some of these uh, larger ones that go from uh, – United States and so on, you can see who, this is a 13,000 kilometer cable that was installed by Tata Communications. Or you pick a different one and this was the Global Cloud Exchange on this cable. Uh, pick a different one and then you've got all of these vendors that put that cable in. So they've shared the burden of, of installing that particular cable. I'm sure that uh, Obviously, there's some international guidelines to how these cables have to be run. And it's not just a little fiber optic cable, right? These cables are the size of a dinner plate, uh, and they have um, 
you know, lots and lots of different uh, fiber bundles inside of them to transport the data. But it's very interesting how, how it interconnects. So a lot of people are not aware that that's how you get from the United States to Europe, or that's how you get from the United States to Africa and so on. All right. Uh, it's a very bad thing when one of these cables gets cut or destroyed. That's happened before, right? Um, where you might have, you know, a single cable that interconnects a location, uh, like for example, this one here that uh, connects, um, you know, uh, different locations. Uh, we've seen it, right? I believe this cable here at one point got cut. Um, uh, I know there was one that was that went to Egypt that got cut one time, uh, and it affected millions of customers, right? Um, you know, fishing trawlers go through, drag their nets and stuff, and they grab one of those cables and they can get broken. So literally what happens when uh, when one of these cables gets broken is that, that you'll have your little ship here, uh, and you've got this cable that's broken, uh, maybe some sort of damaged connection, and they'll actually grab both ends of that cable, they'll pull them up to the ship, and they'll re-splice it, and then put it back down, and, uh, um, and, and fix that cable. They very rarely will actually run a new cable, so they'll use ROVs and stuff like that, to go in, uh, and maybe dive divers and stuff to get those cables. I don't know what the deepest one is, I haven't looked, but I imagine they're pretty deep. Okay. Now, way back in the day, we used to communicate over something called circuit switch technology, right? Um, I don't know if you guys ever remember those uh, Candace Bergen commercials, you know, so quiet you could hear a pin drop. You know, you'd have your MCIs and your AT&Ts and your South, Southwestern Bell and so on. They were providing telephony services for uh, users and for, for networks, right? But those telephony services were circuit switched. So you had a, a device that had a physical wire that connected to a PBX, uh, and that PBX had some physical wires, which were called trunks, that connected to other PBXs, and uh, so on and so forth. When you picked up the phone here and you dialed digits and you dialed numbers, you would be literally sending some sort of signaling to the PBX to indicate how you wanted that call to be routed. And uh, then you'd have some relay inside this telephone switch, and, uh, and then that would relay that to another switch and another switch and so on. Eventually, so let's say this guy's in LA, this guy's in New York, you would actually have a circuit path dedicated for that communication channel. Uh, I don't know if you guys remember, back in the day, you would hear, you would make a phone call and you'd get a message saying, all circuits are busy, right? When was the last time that happened? Unless you're overseas, it still happens overseas. but. Um, that's because there just weren't enough physical circuit paths to support the calling and support the transactions. Uh, that's not the way the networks work today. Even telephony networks don't work that way today, right? In fact, what have we shifted to? Not circuit switch, but... Hmm? Well, even cellular, cellular uh, devices fall under this new categorization of transporting data, packet switch. Right. Everything is packetized. Uh, everything is packetized and sent over the network as data. Okay. Um, so, and, and the benefit, of course, of having this packetized network and uh, being able to packetize this information is that we can now make intelligent decisions. Now, we have a gentleman here with a computer, but it could be a phone, right? In fact, most phones today are voice over IP or IP telephony devices, and they're going to take that data, they're going to convert it into some sort of uh, packet that's going to get sent over the network. Now, that packet can be routed, it can be switched, and if a particular circuit path becomes busy or unavailable, we can reroute that data over a different path and so on. Okay, so we're taking our data, traditional data, like voice and video, and we're now generating these packets and these datagrams so that we can transfer that data across the network. That's why, by the way, now, we don't pay for long distance anymore, typically, um, because, uh, because all of our voice is packetized and it's being sent over a data network that, that's already been built to support other services, right? Um, and it's a very, very 
big business, right, to packetize information and packetize data. Uh, cellular company, companies are doing it. Yes, you have traditional wireless communication from your cell phone to a tower, but I guarantee once that data gets to the tower, it's being converted into a packet and being sent across an IP network, okay? What is the benefit of packetizing information? We can do intelligent routing. We can, uh, we get a, what we call economies of scale. Uh, where the network is robust enough to support multiple lines of communication. So it's a really, really important concept. It gives us a lot of flexibility and a lot of availability in being able to determine how data gets sent across the network. Of course, packetizing information also makes it um, a little bit more complicated, right? Uh, traditionally, I mean, you think about this from this concept. Traditionally, we would have a, uh, let's do this, uh, we would have a, um, a PBX, right? Uh, and that PBX would have line cards in it. And those line cards would, ha would have a physical cross connect to some sort of punch down panel on the wall, right? So you'd have these cross connects and then your telephones that were used by the users would have a physical wire that went to that panel. So you couldn't just unplug the phone move it to a different office and plug it in and have it work, right? Because it had yet to actually change this physical wiring. And by the way, this PBX had to be big enough to support the number of users that you had to have as well, right? Most IP telephony solutions today uh, obviously don't work that way. They work over a packetized network where the phones are basically computers that are attaching to the network, and they're going to support 7,000, 8,000, 10,000 phones in one server, a one use server that goes into your rack. So uh, much, much different than what we've seen in the past. Okay, so that concludes uh, the first chapter. Very, very basic chapter. Uh, like I said, some of these introductory chapters are very basic, but I promise you we will be getting into some more complex discussions as we move through the rest of the lessons. So let's go ahead and move on to uh, the second lesson.